All right, uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rebecca Zanbergen, so I host CBC London's morning show, London Morning. Um, and I'm here with author and journalist and essayist and social commentator Stephen Marsh. He's written articles for all kinds of magazines, The Wall Street Journal, for The Atlantic, Esquire. He's written six books, seven books? Seven Somewhere books. around there. Seven books. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's seven. Let me think. Well, I counted in your, I think it's seven. Or, I think it's seven. This is the seventh. Correct. Yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> that, makes me, that makes sense. Okay. Okay. And we're here, of course, to talk about his, um, his latest book, The Next Civil War, which, of course, is speculative nonfiction. Which, how do you feel about that as a categorization of your work? Oh, I came up with that phrase. Oh, you did. So, yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> it's the it's what I told my editor I was going to do, and yeah, the speculative nonfiction. It's kind of a different take. I was more or less stealing from the movie. The, remember that there was that television movie, The Day After. Yes, right. That told, and it was the it was the most watched television event ever, actually, and it um, it told the story of like a, what a nuclear attack on Lawrence, Kansas, would look like, and it just used all the best science to show what the future might look like. And basically the idea was I would do the same in this case for political events in the United States. And why? Because well, I think that was the, the first question I had was you're a Canadian and you're writing about this inevitable civil war potentially in the Well, I don't know about inevitable, <laughs> but trending. It's trending in yeah. that way. Right, okay, fine. We won't use the word inevitable. Mm -hmm. Why did you as a Canadian feel you were in the right position to write this book? Oh, I think Canadians actually are sort of the best people to examine American uh, politics. I mean, I think we, we actually have a pretty good tradition of that, like from people like Malcolm Gladwell and even, uh, you know, Carter at Vanity Fair and so on. Like, I think when you're outside of these American structures of power, but you're also pressed right up against them, like you watch your whole life. Like, I mean, I can name many American senators. I don't, I think I can name a couple of Canadian senators. Um, like when you're, when you're so <laughs> familiar with American politics and American life and American culture, but you're not of it, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a perfect vantage point to watch what you're seeing. Um, I mean, especially in the case of cataclysmic events because the Americans absolutely don't want to see what's happening and um, and it hurts their pride what's happening to them and it's also that uh, you know they have become so overwhelmed by their own um, information systems and their own partisan uh, you know systems of information that they really can't see much clearly anymore so I think actually it, this was kind of a book that could only be written by a Canadian in a way interesting so you, you also say that, you know, whether or not it's inevitable, which we can't say that. Right. But you do say that they are very much in the midst of strife, right? Civil strife. Yeah. And, and when did that begin? Like, how did we get to this place where you can say that categorically? Well, I mean, there are a lot of different answers for where did this, like, where did this tension start? Um, I mean, you know, like the definition of civil war from PRIO, which is the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, starts at 1,000 combatant deaths, and civil strife starts at 25. And so they've been over 25, like what they, what they classify as political murder, um, since, since uh, 2008. And, um, and you know, also I think that number is hugely underrated because things like the mass murder of those uh, African-American people in Buffalo um, that would not count towards political murder, although any other any other place in the world, you would absolutely say that's a political insurgent committing mass murder, right? So, um, you know, the, the numbers are probably lower, seem lower than they actually are. But where it started, I mean, there's a bunch of answers. Every expert that I talk to on on every point in this book, like all, every different factor, um, brought up 2008. 2008 is the year where really what had before been very extreme positions in American politics uh, became quite normal and mainstream and entered main, mainstream political life. Um, obviously, you have uh, the, the number one factor is the housing crisis and, you know, the, the basically the defeat of the American middle class in a cataclysmic event, but also, you know, the election of Barack Obama and the end of uh, you know, white iconography being replaced by multicultural iconography. And also, I also think the surge in Iraq, the failure of the surge in Iraq, where it became clear that America was not the global beneficent policeman who was going to take care of everything. 
And when you say the election of Barack Obama and sort of the, you know, white people being suddenly surprised and yeah. that they live in a society where multiculturalism is a thing as well, is that, I, I've, I've read that that's often a, a signal that civil unrest is around. If the, those who had previously enjoyed a certain level of esteem or elitism, yeah. then, then you have strife. Well, yeah, it, it's actually very interesting. It's certainly not something limited to white people or Americans. Um, when you have, like, one of the most interesting studies they did came from India, where they had um, Hindu Muslim, a, a very decent way of tracking Hindu Muslim expenditures uh, on a state level and, and by a precinct level. And so there were these two English economists who tracked the, the relationship between Hindu Muslim expenditure and political rioting, religious-based rioting. And what they noted was that when Muslims got closer to the to the Hindu levels of expenditure, i.e. when the Muslims who are the lower class group as opposed to the dominant Hindus, as they rose, that's where the violence started. So like we have this image of revolution we inherited from the 19th century where you have like, you know, peasants starved of bread go and overthrow the king, right? Um, that was certainly the model of revolution that Karl Marx envisioned, but that's not how it happens. Like how it happens is elites start to feel threatened, not necessarily losing status, only Gary, only losing comparative status, and they and they rebel against that, and that creates political violence. And of course, that's well underway in the United States. But it also, I mean, it happens everywhere. It happens. It certainly happens all over Africa and South Asia and South America too. And was was Donald Trump the answer to that? Well, you know, one of the the things that I find the hardest to convince people of in my book, the argument that I find hardest to convince people of is that I really don't think Donald Trump matters much one way or the other. Yeah, I read that but, in your book. Right. Like I said, I mean, you know, people say like like I write like if Hillary Clinton had been elected in 2016, everything would have gone exactly the same. Like we'd still be in this predicament. America would still be in this predicament. And I I think that's really um key to understand. I mean, even like we've had Biden for two years, but the country keeps fracturing, right? The country keeps like the Dobbs decision has fractured the country probably worse than anything that happened under, uh, during the Trump years, right? So I, I don't think Donald, Donald Trump is at most a symptom of a breakdown that really preceded him. And is fan the flames though, no? Well, I mean, I guess, but you know, like, I guess it would be throwing a little gasoline on the fire, but the fire was already raging, right? And, like, I, like I, I don't think it, and the fire was already out of control, right? And, and so I don't, I don't think he actually makes that much difference, really. So let's talk about who these people are. And I, I think you, what did you call them? The, the anti-government patriots, Yeah, right? anti-government patriots. And so, how, like, who are they? And, they, and, and I, the one thing that I sort of feel is, though, when you looked at what happened at, Capitol, the Capitol building. I mean, they, they, you know, they stormed the building and then they got in there. I mean, this is the only thing that has been encouraging to me. And then they got in there and they didn't know what to do. I feel like right. they just walked around like a bunch of people doing what? I don't know. Well, they did shots. Yeah. I mean, they did shots <laughs> of whiskey. Like, but I mean, I guess you can do anywhere you are, you can do that. So, right. So, so who are they and, and, and how organized are they? Because they certainly didn't seem very organized on that day. Well, I think they are very organized. They just don't have very specific goals in mind. They're, they're you know, m mapping the, the hard right in the United States is extremely difficult to do. Um, I wanted to do it in the book. I wanted to have a chapter where I was just like, here are the different groups. But they actually morph so rapidly that any chapter that I could have written on that subject would have been invalid the moment it was published. Um, I think of it really as um, a smorgasbord of ideologies. Uh, so you have, you know, and, and the other thing is there's a spectrum here from basically small c conservatives all the way to Nazis, and people go up and down this spectrum all the time, right? So you have white nationalists, you have Nazis, you have identitarians, you have European identitarians. These are all different and disagree with each other. Then you have the Ku Klux Klan. That's a separate group entirely. You have sovereign citizens who don't believe that th they believe they are a law unto themselves and that they don't have to respect anything in the republic. Those groups are often connected with white power movements, but there's also definitely a l large significant groups of black uh, sovereign citizens. Uh, uh, there are... And a sovereign citizen is what exactly? Those who a sovereign citizen is a large, you know, large conspiracy group 
which is at minimum like 600,000 people, but actually is much higher. And they simply do not believe that Amer that there are laws that they have to follow. They are a, a law unto themselves. Why aren't are any of these people in jail? Many of them are in jail for many different things. The number one reason to become a law unto yourself is not to pay taxes, right? Um, so a lot of them go around promoting ideas like, hey, I've got this great idea. It's called declaring yourself a sovereign citizen. That way you don't have to pay taxes. The IRS has a different interpretation of that situation, right? Uh, so th there's a bunch of people who are in very significant amounts of jail for that. I, I mean, a bunch of other, they, are, they kill more cops than anyone else. Right. The FBI made them the number one domestic terror threat. I, I think it was in 2017. No, it was earlier. It was 2013. But they've been, they kill cops regularly for traffic stops and all that sort of thing. Um, and they are large growing. And then, you know, they're from there. And then there's a bunch of other people like there who believe that um, the U.S. government has made significant contracts with alien species. And, and this is, you understand this is on a ra range of things, but you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is elected to Congress and she's not far from that, right? Like, like th these, these ideas which, you know, we have these people here too, but you know, they're not connected to any real power, right? Um, and they're not, you know, we all know that they're lunatics, right? So, um, and then you have, you know, one of the things that I found really hard to grasp my, my head around to, to grasp was that they want their beliefs to be esoteric. They don't want it to be accepted, right? They want to believe in something that nobody else understands, and that's a huge. And of course, the internet is just the driving great spot for that. Yeah, it's a great spot for that, and it and, and it drives all of this. The one thing that combines them all, I would say, um, and this is sort of where you get into more mainstream republicanism too, is that they believe that being being a patriot, being for the U.S., is inherently being against the federal government in any way, to the level of paying any taxes of any kind or acknowledging the authority of the federal authority of the United States in any way. So this this is the backdrop under yeah. which you write this book. Um, well, those are the guys I went out and met. Right. There's a lot of back. There's like the political question. There's the legal questions. There's the yeah. environmental questions, which are really significant. There's the inequality questions. But yeah, the, the, they are the fruits. How uh, many of them did you talk to? I mean, did you interview? Oh, people a couple who, dozen. Yeah. I mean, just no. I mean, they all got along with me, right? right? Like, I mean, I look the way I do, and you know, yeah, uh, right. and I'm from Alberta, so it's not the first like <laughs> right wing lunatic I've had pie with, you know. Right. So. Uh, so were you shocked by anything you heard, or you've been doing this for too long that you're not really shocked anymore? Well, I mean, the things that shocked me were. Um, well, I think it's it's very alarming when they're very nice and very normal, and you meet them, and they're taking their kids to soccer practice, and they have jobs. I mean, the ones that really upset me are like, you know, like Nazi lawyers with degrees from Duke, right? And or I mean, Stuart Rhodes, who's the head of the Oath Keepers. I mean, he has a, he has a he has a law degree from Yale, right? I mean, he's not, <laughs> you know, uh, hillbilly elegy, you know, like out of the coal fields of you know, uh, of remote, of some remote mountain town. Like, you know, like this is a very privileged human being who with a very big brain who is, you know, consciously thinking of how to create a white ethno state. I mean, when you go and talk to these guys and say like, okay, how are you going to create this all white ethno state in the Pacific Northwest? They're like, well, we'll model our constitution on Israel's and Japan's. That's upsetting. Like when you hear it, when you hear like when you're like, okay, that's like these are not just you know born to let lose tattoo on the forehead and uh, and like in some dive bar. That's smart. They're and they're organized, right? And they're and they're um, and they have very conscious political goals that are not uh, amenable to you know human equality. So talk to me about how you arrived at the five scenarios in the book, because you had to have had more ideas, and you whittled it down to five, I assume. Right. So what, what, just sort of walk us through each of them, um, and and why you thought that was a relevant one to include in the book. Well, I wanted to I wanted to stay to stuff that I was really sure of, because you know you're dealing with political speculation here. Like there's plenty of it, and mo and it's not useful, right? And I think if you get into like 
I mean, this is a book about the future, but I think when you're like trying to predict the future and you're like the, I wanted really stable trends. Like, you know, the, the, the this depiction of the fall of New York is they know, you know, they have the best researchers in the world have determined to the street um, what parts of New York will fall in a hurricane, right? Of which size. And the guy who, you know, told me that is like a massive reinsurer. Who, those are the guys who insure insurance companies. And, you know, he's responsible for trillion dollars of, of, of risk management, right? And so that's a, good, that's a good model. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's not just like, well, we got a poll here that says that it's going this way and there's a trend line that says this. Like, those are really good models, right? And you can, and that also allows you to say like, okay, well, what, what would it look like if a third, you know, if a, uh, a, a, a three level, a third level hurricane hit New York? Well, I can actually like show a character going through this world where, you know, Wall Street's totally gone, but the park is still there, and you know the, the most of the highways are flooded, but you know this one is still available. So you know you could, you could sort of figure out what it would be like. Um, in the first scenario, which is about a conflict between a, a militia group and a the military, I was very fortunate in that I got a source to talk to me who was the colonel uh, responsible for drawing up what they call full spectrum operations in the homeland. So. That was actually like the U.S. military's prediction of what this conflict would look like. Um, so that you know, again, that's a really solid model. Um, and and then the other the other stuff like uh, the assassination material. There are really excellent um, psychological predictors for who assassins are, and they. I mean, they're just like the guy who just went for Paul Pelosi and the guy who stabbed. Um, What's his name? The uh, Salman Rushdie in the face. Like th that's ex they they got it exactly right. Like ig to the to the where they're living. Like they just know they just they just got their just model is just incredibly good. So you know I based it on that. The thing like I wanted to do one about political fallout, but the truth is I was not able to get good enough information about the what what the collapse of U.S. government from within Congress would look like, uh, because there's just no, I couldn't find an honest broker, to be honest. So like, I, I, didn't, put, I didn't put that in. Um, the separatism chapter uh, was much easier because the separatists all have very clear uh, understandings of how it would work, and, and none of them are true, but you can at least say, well, this is, these are their predictions, they're wrong because of X, Y, Z. And what, what have been the, res I mean, I've read some of the response. Yeah. <laughs> and it hasn't all been, like, some people had thoughts on uh, an outsider looking in, and I think one, one uh, review I said thought you were maybe too gleeful. I don't know if that's the word they use. Gleeful. <laughs> or, like, I'm not you, gleeful. You, you, you seem to, I don't this I'm just referring it's like to. Watching your, it's like watching your big brother get addicted to but there, it's But there is a gleeful. sense, I mean, you're writing about it sort of very clinically in a way that, like, it is clinical, yeah. Yeah, and you're like disassociated from from it because you're Canadian, maybe. But I, I mean, did have you heard feedback where you're like people are angry that you would make these predictions in this way? No, I, I mean, I wouldn't say people were angry. Well, I mean, like I'm a journalist in the 21st century, so like I have my folder of death threats, like everyone else. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I I actually did a funny thing the other day when, when I wrote about the Freedom Convoy for the Atlantic and I just knew I was going to get the hate. Like I was like, so I thought I'd do an experiment where every hate letter I got, I wrote back the sweetest note that I could. That's my favorite right? thing. No, and, it, and it, was, it was fascinating because it was like, like, you know, some of them are just like go die things. And, it, you know, even then I would write back like, well, I'm sorry you had this reaction, but I'm really glad that peace provoked something in you. That's what writing's all about. All best, Stephen. And three and three quarters of them wrote back immediately apologizing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, I mean, like three like three quarters of them immediately wrote back said I'm so sorry. And then we I got into long talks with them, and you know, it, it was very revealing of this anger that's actually they don't even believe. Yeah. It's just like a it's just like a performative thing that they do. But um, you know, in general, like. I've always, every, every time I've done anything with this story, because it was based on a magazine article I wrote in 2018, um, everyone has always been like, you're alarmist, and you're exaggerating. And of course, events 
have progressed and shown that I really am not exaggerating. But I mean, I do remember like going and bringing a draft to my editor in New York, and his uh, his offices are on Avenue of the Americas, Sixth Avenue in New York. And so I was walking, and I was walking across the street, and I was right in front of the Fox News. Fox News is right across the street. And as I was crossing, there were some protesters. I don't even know about what, but a fist fight broke out. And I had to like jump out of the way of this fist fight as I was bringing my the next Civil War manuscript to my editor. And then I we, I was talking with my editor. We we're having a talk in his office. And he's like, "Look, do you? I mean, do you really think this is going to happen? I mean, I don't think people want this." And I was like, "I literally just got out of a fist fight like outside your door. Like you can see outside. There's like people fighting in the streets about it." Um, and then when January 6th happened, I remember I had a bunch of friends say. Well, I guess they'll cancel your book because this is going to be the wake-up call, and it, like it, like America will come to its senses, and this will be the end of this whole sordid affair. And I was like, no, like they'll that like they, they'll salt like they'll the information networks are so twisted that they'll just turn it into their own narrative within a day. But it actually only took six hours for Rush Limbaugh to say. You know, these are the people at Concord. These are the these are the these are the true representatives of the founding fathers. So, I mean, those are the two that like general hate. I don't. I barely even feel at this point. I mean, um, but the the your your two um, alarmist. Uh, I mean, I wish I were. You know, I mean, hopefully, I hopefully this will be a kind of book you find in a used bookstore twenty years from now and be like, oh God, do you remember when that idiot scared everyone with that nonsense? Like. God willing, that's what's going to happen, but it sure doesn't feel that way today. There, there isn't a lot of hope in your book for a way out of this, is there? No, I mean, I, I, like, the end of the book is called On Hope, and, you know, like, um, you know, I'm dealing with, I, I try to see things, as you say, clinically, like, as clearly as possible. Um, I wrote it kind of the way that I would think a um, senior executive at a government or or a company would want the situation spelled out for them, like clearly with the, with the stats, with the numbers and the arguments up front, like no hiding around the weaknesses either. Like you know the economic models, I talk about them in the book, but they're just so weak. Like they don't they don't have any. They're, they're already useless now, right? But the environmental models, like they just happen. Right, like they, they, they are, they're, they've been off by a quarter of percentage points since 1965. They're very good, right? So, um, you know, and I just try to be honest about that. Like I try to be honest. These models are strong. These models are weak. Th these are these are the ones that. So, that clinical thing, um, you know, where there are not really a lot of trends that I see are like leading to more political solidarity in the United States. That's that's fair. Have we, uh, so do you see this as a very unique time in American history that we have not seen before? I know you compare it to like the 60s and the civil rights uh, movement, but you say this movement sort of dwarfs that movement, I think is what I've. Yeah, I mean, th there was a lot of violence in, in the 60s in the United States. 140 cities burned after MLK's assassination, and you had you know, multiple assassinations within a very brief window of time. But, um, you know, the thing is the institutions in the 60s were so stable that they could channel that violence and they could they could mollify that violence um and they and they you know in hindsight they were very effective like if you take watergate as an example where you know it, it seems like it's a bad event but actually what it was was the press reporting on something everybody believing in it politicians needing to respond to the public sense of national outrage Politicians being bipartisan in their a attempt to preserve national institutions, and the Department of Justice acting apolitically when that demand was made. Literally, none of that would happen today. None of it is happening today. But is right? that, do you do you think that's in part uh, not because people are more ideologically diverse or spread apart, but because there is this means in which you can find out and get whatever you want on the internet, like social media and the proliferance of like all of those crazy ways in which people are like in the dark web. Like I just feel like there are other ways in which those institutions are being diminished now. Well, the, the decline in trust in institutions of all kinds, I mean, that's kind of the meta trend of this um, whole process where it's not just decline of trust in government and law, 
Um, it's which those are those have rapidly declined since 1980. It's decline in the police, in the media, in the church, in you know, in basically every institution in the United States, right? Well, what's called civil society generally, right? And so that decline is definitely the source of a major source of the weakness here, right? I mean, there are many sources of weakness. It's a complex cascading system, but um, the fact that there's no trust between these institutions and no trust in these institutions really and limits... And goes back to 2008 in your mind? Well, as I, like 2008 is the one that the experts gave me. I mean, you could go back to 1877 and the compromised election where um, essentially they ended uh, recon Reconstruction and where they gave the South more or less home rule, uh, and which divided the country along the lines that you know it's still divided on. Um, you could, if you wanted, go back to the founding of the country, which was always about irreconcilable sides trying to make compromises on things like the reality of a human being uh, that are not subject to compromise. They were making compromises about them. So you could trace it. I mean, it depends how far back you want to go. I mean, when you, you try to figure out what the origin of the first civil war is, uh, it's exactly the same process. Like, the closer you get to the event itself, everything seems very contingent and very, like, if, if Lincoln weren't elected, if the South Carolina delegates didn't go to Georgia for the opening of the railway, would the, they probably, you know, they were, South Carolina was really driving um, this, the, the spearhead to secession, right? So if they had not gone there and managed to convince the Georgia delegates, maybe it wouldn't have happened. But then the farther back you look, you're like, well, Manifest destiny means that every time you open up a new state, you have to re-prosecute the entire question of slavery and non-slavery states. You have the nullification crisis. You have, uh, you know, Harper's Ferry. You have bloody Kansas, right? Like, it, all in hindsight, everything seems inevitable. Uh, you know, they were so unprepared for the first Civil War that the North had to send to Europe for guns. Right? Like, they didn't have any weapons. Um, which is an extraordinary thing to think of, like America, like asking France for rifles, right? But that's how that's how un, that's how unprepared they were. They had no idea, and no one, like, absolutely nobody saw it coming. Like even Jefferson Davis said, when the first guns started shooting on Fort Sumner, he was like, "It's probably just the end of a political crisis," right? Uh, and that was like that's the start of the war, right? So. Yeah, people really don't want to see what's coming, and it's... You don't want to call it... I, I'm con I'm a little confused, I have to say. Yeah. The, the first sentence of your book, which I can't rattle off, which you can... Which yes, is, the United States is coming to an end. But you won't you won't say a, a civil war is how? inevitable. Well, there are, there are many ways for uh, the United States to end that... that do, well, the donor... Like, how how it's all going to fall out is a different matter. Like I, that, I don't know, right? I mean, plus there's like, are they? Would separatism be an option? Uh, an option? Separate states? I mean, it's a pretty reasonable option from my point of view. Like when you look into the differences between the po politics of these places and the increasing sense of siege mentality that's emerging in these in these separated states. I mean, that does not seem to me like an unreasonable approach. Um, you know, also the United States went through a civil war and came out the other end of it, right? So. When, and when I say the United States is coming to an end, like I, what I really mean is a crisis is at hand, right? And and what the what the fallout from that crisis is going to be, I don't know. It's also worth remembering that America is the great country of regeneration and personal transformation and political transformation. And if anyone can solve their problems, it, it's them. I just don't see any evidence that anyone is trying to solve them. I think some people uh, might think that the the riot on the on the the siege on a capital was yeah. was an indication that they are more resilient because it, it didn't amount to. I mean, yes, some people died, but it didn't amount to mass deaths as as one would assume it could have when you look at what was going on. Like, I think I. I, have, I mean, I, that's a pretty low standard. I, it is a low like, standard. Well, but... I mean, there wasn't mass death. <laughs> Well, like, I, mean, I mean, there wasn't mass death. That's... There wasn't mass death in the Troubles in Northern Ireland either, right? I mean, you, you're already having like every prominent Democrat needs complete personal security at all times. Every every justice needs complete personal security at all times. 
uh, no, like no political operative who matters in the United States is secure. Right. It would just seem that if the U.S. was going to spiral, that seemed like a moment it was about to, and it didn't really, any more than it no. already was. Well, this is a process. Yeah. Like, I mean, you could say when Charles Sumner beat Preston Brooks to death, or half to death on, on the Senate with a gold tip cane, you'd be like, well, they recovered from that, right? I mean, you could say, well, they came to a peace at Munich, so there probably wasn't going to be a Second World War, right? Like, like I mean... Things, things don't just have. It's not just like there's violence and then it goes out of control. It's like this is a constant cascading system. I mean, hopefully it, you're right. Hopefully you're right. And it's like, well, they are resilient. But you know, I mean, when you look at in depth and closely at the American electoral system, like how it is made, like how who is who is in power is decided. I mean. It's like a Rube Goldberg machine that needs oiling. Like it's not, and, and it's it's state by state. I mean, it's 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 a ludicrous system, right? And uh, and like the idea that it's holding things together is very frightening to me. Do you see a way forward then, in which I mean, I, I know you don't have the answers to how it will end, but do you yeah. see do you see a way forward in which there's peace and? I don't know, that resilience comes through in some way for the U.S. I mean, well, increasingly, like, what I think they need, you know, one of two options. Um, one is a constitutional convention. Because, I mean, their constitution is just, I, I mean, it's fascinating from an outsider. This is one of the things where being a Canadian really helps. Because I haven't been inculcated into this cult of the U.S. Constitution. And, I mean, it is extraordinary when you go everywhere in America how they worship it. I mean, you're talking, you're out there talking to a Texas separatist, right? I am a Texan more than I'm an American. I, and, and you're like, well, and then, and then he, and then he will go on like a 45 minute rant about how secession is constitutional. And I'm like, I come from a country with an active se secessionist movement. They don't care about the, con they, don't, they don't care about the BNA Act. Like they don't, it's not like we're gonna keep the spirit and letter of the BNA Act. They just were like, no, we want our own country with our own rules. Um, but even the separatists worship the constitution. So do the liberals, so does everyone. It's a great, a work of great genius, but it's a work of 18th century genius. It really has no, a lot of it doesn't have any meaning in a 21st century context. And nobody, ha nobody has any idea what it really is saying anymore. So you have this, fundamentally emptied out document worshiped like a holy text and it's you know it's that that is sort of even spiritually dangerous that's and, one thing you wanted to change well they need it like they need what is going to be required here is very profound structural change i mean there's lots of things that they could do to take the gas off to take their foot off the pedal i mean one thing is like open primaries just a real obvious one Right, like if you if you had open primaries, you 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 take half the brutality out of American politics tomorrow. No one is going to do that because the money, the the huge fundraising, you know, beast relies on anger. Right, I mean, it, like they are now in a system where anger drives money, which drives politics, and you know, the, and and no one is has the interests of the country as a whole at stake, except for very marginal players. Like people who really are not going to have a say. I mean, there's lots that they could do to take their, to 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 lower the temperature. They just never ever seem to do it, mm. right? I mean, and I don't know. You know, you talk to some of these Republican operatives, but Democrat. I mean, you talk to Democratic operatives, and they're so, um. They they're like, oh, abortion's a huge opportunity for us because it's going to be a big fundraising. You know, because it creates so much anger that it creates a huge amount of influx of money. And I'm like, talk about missing the point. Meanwhile, you talk to Republican operatives who are like overseeing the end of their party's belief in democracy for a little career. I mean, I, it, it's. I mean, sometimes I look at them and I think, what what is the long term plan here? Like, there's not going to be political operatives if you're not in a democracy. You know, but it is the sort of quarter to quarter thinking that I see among, uh, you know, political people um, that, I, you know, is one of the reasons why my hope, the, there was lots of hope in America. America, uh, there's, betting against America has tended not to go well, like for sure. But when you're not putting any effort into change, I don't see why you, how you can just change.
you know, and I don't see anyone putting any effort into it. And how, I'm, I'm going to get to audience questions in a minute here too, but I, I, I am curious and I'm sure people are wondering your thoughts on how much of what is happening in the States, and we see, you know, evidence of this on this side of the border, but how much of it is sort of making its way over here and affecting our democracy and affecting, you know, your, your belief that we have a solid system? Well, um, you know, obviously, like the metaphor I always use is like, if you're living next to a meth house, like eventually something burning will land in your backyard, right? And so there's no question that it's going to affect us. I mean, if we end up living, you know, not next to a democracy, and in particularly, you know, a country that we are dependent on, and we are, I, there's no, I don't see any solution for us not being dependent on. I don't know how we would get independence from the United States in any meaningful way. Um, like, you know, obviously that's going to affect us. On the other hand, you know, we're, I don't think we're anywhere near the partisanship levels uh, that, I mean, I just don't hate conservatives. And I don't, like, you know, like, I, I'm from Alberta. I have lots of family who are conservatives. That's I, certainly, why. I, well, <laughs> but I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I, I don't think they hate me either, right? Like, I feel like there's a lot of hate, a well, lot of hate. you have to understand, like, in the book, one of the most crazy statistics is that, like, when you do precinct levels for and and geolocation for Thanksgiving dinners, families where there's interparty, like interparty families, they eat Thanksgiving dinner about an hour less. Wait, what research are we talking about? It's in the book. It's in the <laughs> book, but it's like, but it's in it's in the it's like they they did precinct level politics compared to and they use phone locators to do sort of this meta-analysis. So like, if people are from different political precincts are eating dinner together, it's 30 to 50 minutes less than when they, it's same party things. You know, my mother voted for Doug Ford. She's still coming to dinner. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, it, like that, we're, we're nowhere near that kind of um, rage that, that, that is animating them. Like, the, you feel on an interstitial level, uh, I mean, just on the most basic human level. Um, I think also, you know, we do have some protections in that we have a stable civil service. Uh, like, when I was at the 2016 inauguration, I went to a, um, like, I was invited to a party at, like, 2 in the morning in Georgetown for this bureaucrat who was, like, the, you know, he's, like, the low-level bureaucrat at the FDA. And he had all the pictures of the presidents from the wall, and he'd taken his chair from work. And I asked him what was going on, and he said, no one came to replace us today. We turned off the lights at the FDA, right? And that, that's actually what just made me decide to write the book, because I was like, that, that can't end well. Uh, and so, like, we, ha we, have, we have a little more, we also have a constitution you can understand. I mean, clearly some premiers don't, aren't reading it very carefully. But, uh, but I think there's just a lot more stability in our system than, than there is. I, I mean, I know there is. There's just a, there's just a, you know, we are peace, order, and good government. They're life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think, obviously, we're vulnerable, but we're, I mean, we're, we have so far to go to get to where they are that, I, I mean, I think we're a long way away. All right. Well, that's encouraging. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, we're safe here right up until their troops come for our water, but, you know. All right, Do, are there questions? Does anyone have a question for Stephen? Come on, yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But it was very marginal. Like before 2008, like the Texas nationalist movement before 2008, they were being shot at in the woods by the FBI. Now they have 58% of Republican support. It's a big difference. Yeah.
Well, well, the difference between America and Canada are, I, I mean, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> like, those are, the, that is a subject, like, I think there are, like, the thing that's so fascinating is, of course, it's a kinship relationship, right? Like, as you're an American who lives here, you know, I've got my Trump voting cousin in Seattle. I've, got, I've lived in America. I've made my living in America my whole life. Uh, you know, I was a columnist at Esquire, right? Like, like this, 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 it's not like being France, France beside England. Like, we're actually mostly the same people, like often the same families, especially when you get to southwestern Ontario. And I mean, I think it's 90% of the country lives within 100 miles of the American border, right? So it's not about people. Right, like that's the most important thing to like. The, the thing I'm describing in the United States is not because there's something wrong with Americans. Like quite the opposite, it's that the systems by which their lives are lived are in breakdown. Right, and I, I certainly am not of the opinion that like I, that Canadians are better or have or have um, better hearts or something like that. I know it's not true, you know, as someone who's lived in both places. But this it's a question of the structures of these systems and what they do to people, right? I mean, like, I don't think when you look at civil wars that happen in other countries, right, like those breakdowns happen very suddenly and they happen over very basic things like suddenly everyone loses trust in the Supreme Court, right? And they think that the Supreme Court as a spoil to be gained, you know, in this partisan combat, right? So, you know, what you have in, you know, like, so that's happening in the United States, right? Like, that's, and it, it just isn't happening here, right? Like, it, like, so I agree with you, you know, you said originally, like, what happens in America, like, tends to happen here about 15 years later, 10, 15 years later. I mean, that's obviously true. And I think when you look at things like the Freedom Convoy, um, that's also true. But, you know, there are some real, like, you know, Canada's the only country where the more patriotic you are, the more you believe in multiculturalism. And then there's, the others, there's other weird things, like Canada's one of the only countries in the world where, fa now, I don't know what this means, or I, don't, I actually don't know where this comes from, but, like, where trust in institutions is growing, which is also really strange, right? Like, that's, that, like, that does, yeah. it is, yeah. I mean, that, that, I saw some new research about that last week, which is, really very odd. Um, you know, we're about to import 500,000 immigrants next year, and there's no political fallout at all. No, no, like, like no, no one is opposed to that in even the slightest way. It, well, I think also partly like one of the big differences between Canada and the U.S. is that any leader who's going to emerge for this country has to speak two languages. Like, I don't think that's a small factor. Like, it's very hard to play the ethnic card when the, you know, the, the dominant ethnicity of your country is actually two, right, that, that are, have been compromising with each other and weird about compromising with each other for 150 years. So, yeah, I mean, just to be clear, like, I, I certainly don't think there's something in the Canadian spirit that's superior in any way to what I see in America. But the, st the structures of the, and the systems are much, are much better. And, 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 and I don't even know if they're better, they're just more stable, right? And they, and they, don't, they, don't, they don't exhibit signs of imminent civil war. Are there any other questions out there? Yes, we'll go to you next. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 
Oh no. Oh, I, I just mean. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things we're dealing with here is something that's happening all over the world, right? It's happening in Italy. It's happening in Israel. It's happening in the UK. It's and it's certain, for certainly parts of it are happening here. Daniel Smith, the Freedom Convoy, right? I mean, we're now in a world where, for huge chunks of the world, a, a, a maple leaf flag means anti-government, like you're opposed to government mandates. Very strange world, right? But. I guess what I would say, and I mean, it is obviously only comparative, because there's no question that we are prey to these same forces, and you can see them working in our own society, but it's just, are, are we better, are, what is our state in relation to that storm, if you see what I will, if you see what I mean? Like, that is obviously coming for us, but can we, what are, how is, how are we going to be able to deal with it? How, and our institutions are, you know, not ideal, like obviously not, but they seem to me much, I guess it's, it's, it's sort of like when you're, to use the metaphor of your neighbor being a meth head, like we're just dealing with a little alcohol problem. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Like, like we could probably get out of this. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's only, uh, so def I take your point completely. That you know we're definitely facing the same anxieties as everyone else, and the whole world is facing it, right? Um, and but I think we're just better than we're just better. Our systems are better prepared than really either the UK or or England or uh, oh sorry the UK or America. I th that's that's uh, I, I certainly don't feel hopeful for our situation, but I don't feel like I feel like America is really on the brink of something horrible. And I, I don't feel like we're on the brink. We, we still have a long way to go. I mean, I know that's not the most encouraging. We have a, another question like over here. Was You have the question? Yeah. Right. I know. I could, that was the one I couldn't sleep after, yeah. Oh boy. Well, I mean, if we get authoritarian, they won't be. It won't be environmental authoritarianism. I mean, that's a that's a non-existent political movement. Although that would be fascinating. That that make a, that make a good science fiction novel. But um, no, I mean, I mean, I think um, preparing for climate change, mitigating climate change, like all institutions are doing that. Um, you know, the institutions that survive are all doing that, right? Uh, it's when you have this institutional decline that they're really incapable. Of, like, the, the decision of Trump to take down the Manhattan Seawall is one of the worst, most appalling political decisions in history. I don't think people really have recognized, like, that in a fit of peak, he essentially endangered the existence of Manhattan, right? And... To have a to have a country to have a, like eighty five percent of the world's um, currency exchanges go through Manhattan. It is a it is the jewel of the world, right? Like to have it as a possession, uh, like just simply as a national possession, is one of the great gifts of history. Like I mean, no one no one has a city like that, right? And to take down its protections for Political vanity is so like that is you know one of the the com the hardest terms in this book is like complex cascading systems. That means like how f how these feedback loops work, right? So you have I mean I, I, one of the guys explains to me he's like, look, here's what happened. There was um, environmental crisis in Central America that sent waves of uh, immigrants up to the border. That created a political anti-immigrant reaction in the United States, which led to the election of Donald Trump. Donald Trump removed the seawall from Manhattan. So this is how the environment, and then when that seawall is gone, when the, like, when, if a hurricane hits New York, they're just incredibly in a dangerous state. And you know, like re rebuilding New Manhattan is not like rebuilding New Orleans, right? Like in Manhattan has billions and billions of dollars in every square kilometer of 
of, of its reality, right? So, like, he, it's just the way that, like, forces outside of politics lead to bad political decisions and then make you much more vulnerable to things that are outside of politics. That's how this loop works, right? So, no, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think a, um, a green Mussolini is the correct stance, uh, but I, I think, you know, pre preparing for this stuff is abs has to be on the absolute priority of everyone, right? Well, I mean, see, people are making steps on that, right? Like, if there were any part of the book where I would say, like, well, people n have recognized the problem and are trying to make steps to solve it, that would be the one. Right, like, like that would be the one. Like the guy I talked to about corn, which was the only interview I did in the whole book that I couldn't sleep after, where he basically explained how cheap corn has kept the world alive, and we're about to lose cheap corn because of water in the Midwest. Um, and like, I just got very, very afraid. Um, you know, he's just a cheerful, optimistic guy who's trying to problem solve, right? And I think there, and and in the even in the urban centers, like they are taking some steps to, you know, mitigate the effects of this change. Now, it's not going to be complete, and it's not going to save everything, but on the other hand, they are, you know, the, the switch to solar energy and so on, like, they're, they are making real, real progress, right? I don't think it's, that, that's one step where it's like, well, that's one part of the book where I think, you know, there's, there's a real cause for hope there, whereas protecting American democracy, no one. Like no, no, like no, restoring trust in the legal system, no one. Like it's just careening, careening down. So yeah, I think chapter three is definitely the scariest one, uh, but also the most accurate one, right? Because it's like based on the best models, right? But um, but also the one I think there's actually a little, a little tiny glimmer of hope. Not a glimmer. One yes. More. One more minute. I have one more minute. Okay, is there any one last question? I thought Josh had a question. <laughs> yes, at the back. Yeah. Yes. But see, I mean, like Trump. Trump scares me, but the person, the people that really scare me these midterms are the 345 election deniers who are running for offices across the United States. And you know, some portion of them are going to get an office, right? Like whether it's 100, whether it's 200, whether it's 300, right? And you know, there is a very clear way that in 2024 there could be a president elected who did not win the majority of electoral college votes or the majority of the thing. And that, that doesn't have anything to do with Trump, right? Like that, 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 is, that is strictly a force outside of him. And so like the, Trump produces anxiety because that's what he does, right? Like he, like that's his job in a sense, like to create rage and then monetize it, right? Like, you know, burying his wife on it. I mean, he's the kind of guy who buries his wife on a golf course for the tax break, right? But, um, but th those election deniers, like, they're going to be very hard to unroot from the American political system. They are going to terrorize a very vulnerable electoral system, and that they're they're already in a situation where only about two thirds of the country believes that the current president was legitimately elected. So. I mean, they mean that it's it's quite likely. I mean, I don't I don't like to make predictions, but it's quite likely that in the next election, a huge majority of Americans will not feel they have a legitimately elected president. That's much scarier than than Donald Trump. Oh yeah. Well, I, th I mean, he definitely ha it has it has an impact, obviously. Like he was president, but to me, like the deeper trends are are much like 
he, he has an effect, but, you know, Biden has an effect too, but he isn't stopping anything from happening, right? And the, it, it, to me, the, the thing to focus on is really the, that's why I'm not even worried about the election, right? Like, it, it's just not, so, like, because it, it's kind of the horse race politics aspect of this are much less important than I think anyone understands at this point. Like, the trends are going on their own. And, you know, Trump can, can you know, un, undo the break, but he can't really do much more than that. So. Okay, and I think uh, that wraps up our session. So thanks to Stephen Marsh for being here today. We really appreciate it.